this is the global view. So we are looking down at the poles. Uh, the circles are latitude, geomagnetic latitude. So the pole is at the top and then 80 degrees, 70 degrees, 60 degrees. Um, where you start here, the kind of um, slightly wavy uh, lines are um, these quiet arcs. You can have one, you can have a couple of them develop. Um, it's important to note, like going from A to B, as this classic substorm develops, um, it's the equatormost arc that gets a little brighter, um, is a bit more of a bolder line here. So you can tell in B that that quiet arc has started to stretch south. Um, and you can see this. Uh, this is harder to see from some of the uh, locations a lot further away from the pole, um, like you guys are typically. Um, so, you know, if you're down here at like 50 degrees, your circle is not even on this map. Um, but the, the edge of the arc, it's going to be a little bit harder to see if it's coming a little bit closer to you or away from you. Um, that's my impression. Um, and then my impression from being further north where you're kind of closer to under this auroral oval, like if you're in Yellowknife, Canada or, or Fairbanks, is that you can really see um, this quiet arc like somewhere in the sky and then start to move further south. Um, and then I should also note very importantly that this top view any kind of space physics paper that you're talking about, um, the question is, where is the sun? Um, anybody want to give me a definition or a where is the sun in this image? Anybody got it figured out here? It's opposite from the the biggest bulge of the the farthest. Yeah, um, yeah, it's it's at the top of the image, right? And and midnight is at the bottom. So if you're on the Earth, um, and this is the cartoon of the whole Earth, and you're at midnight, that's where you would be seeing the strongest aurora and the furthest south aurora tending to be around midnight. Um, whereas uh, on the right-hand side of these circles, that's um, towards dawn. And we'll see as we go through the later images that the aurora changes towards dawn. Um, and then on the other side is, is dusk. So if it's really early where you are, um, you're going to see a little bit less of that auroral oval. Um, but yeah, what happens uh, between B and C is really kind of key uh, because that's where the aurora um, breaks up. And um, and it breaks up from this one quiet arc where something happens on the equatorward most edge of the arc. In this case, in our, in our case, northern hemisphere bias, the most southern edge. Um, and then it's expanding north. Um, and you can see the direction of travel. There's some arrows on these um, uh, underneath the lines, basically. Um, and it, it gets much more active. Uh, it's not like just one discrete arc. Um, and then even later um, in this phase, uh, you get more strong motion um, to the both the west um, and the east. Um, we're going to, I think the paper goes on to talk about the types of aurora. Um, for each of these phases. But um, I believe in D is where kind of that westward traveling surge is shown, uh, if you can see where my cursor is now. Um, actually, in C and D, I think it's the, the sort of bulge that starts at midnight and then goes west, um, which means that if it's not even midnight near you, if a substorm has started where it is midnight, it could be coming towards you. Um, uh, I rely on my Manitoba people to let me know when it's coming. Yeah, yeah. And, um, and, and if it's a really big um, 
really big uh, events, it can also be expanding to the east as well. Um, so this is sort of the point of Aurorasaurus then, that, that people who are in the part where this is all happening can then warn the people around them that it's coming. Is that correct? Yeah. It, that's, yeah, that's one of our goals. And I think um, a kind of question that we could ask uh, that I think people could do to really help with that is um, identifying when you see it break up or when you see it at its peak of motion. So that, or its most energetic, you know, phase. Um, so that's a question that I've had of, can people who are all over be identifying these substorm breakups or onsets, same word, um, which is really that moment. Um, and if you're under the point that that breakup starts from, um, then that's actually an important, like even more important to capture those images because we still don't actually know what causes it to break up. And this has been a study for 40 years in the science field is uh, there's arguments about what causes the substorm to break up, um, whether, and, and to, to really boil that down, um, those arguments can be whether it, something could be triggering in the Earth's ionosphere, close to the Earth, or whether that trigger is coming from way out in space. Um, but I am digressing from the paper, so I'll try and get back to the paper. But, but yeah, um, yes, so A, B, C, and D are kind of all like this something has happened, something exciting has happened, all within maybe half an hour. Um, you can take all this kind of time frames with some grain of salt here because there's a lot of variation between in a classic substorm. Um, I read this paper a long time ago before I saw any aurora, and then when I did see aurora, I was like, where's the substorm? You know, I expected it to do exactly what they describe in this paper, and it does not on average. On, very often. Um, but th these are still important patterns and it's important that um, something that I've recently realized translating to the ground, or to people on the ground, is kind of this global picture, which is how the scientists are used to thinking about it, because this was such a big discovery that there's this global picture. Um, that's not how it, you know, you're seeing a piece of this um, activity from the ground. And so to explain the substorm from a ground-based perspective um, is, a, is a different thing than, than this paper. But um, understanding this paper helps you understand how what you see on the ground, depending on what time it is and where in this pattern you are, is going to change. Um, and so in section E and F, um, the substorm is relaxing back down, recovering, um, and you get different types of aurora, especially on more the mor morning side. Um, and, uh, and then things kind of begin to, um, go, uh, equator word again, um, and repeat. So that was a lot. Um, so I will pause and see if that made any sense. <laughs> um, say no, yes, maybe. <laughs> um, so if I'm reading you right, C and D then are the, the part that we're most, as, as chasers, most excited about. Um, that's the part with the most activity? Um, or is it E? Yeah, yeah, yep. Um, cool. That's not necessarily the same as the part that you're going to see most of the time. Um, mm -hmm. I, I think Aurora does tend to spend quite a bit of time building up and, and settling back down, right? So those aspects, um, you know, it's, to me, it's about sort of appreciating um, all of those assets. But yeah, you know, like the money shots are probably the the brief moments of like the peak activity, basically, right? Um, 
Uh, can you guys hear me this yeah. time? Okay. So I do have a um, comment on the fact that I know we were talking about, I have seen them too, like going from east to west most of the time, you know, the, 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 yes. the active part. But uh, on April 20th, 2020. Um, Engine, your I mic's actually... up and I can't hear you. Are other people here? At least can you yeah, hear I, can, I can hear him fine. Oh. Okay. Probably okay. a browser version issue. <laughs> um, yeah, so April 20th, on 2020, um, I watched an entire event going from start to the end. And there was actually a very active spot went from west to east. And I did. I didn't take an entire video, but I take. I took uh, many images of the entire sequence. Um, is there any reason? Have you ever seen yeah. that happen? On why that would happen? Yeah, yeah, that's a great question, and this is why I really like the dialogue discussion um, that we can have with the paper here too. Um, so. Uh, could be something else, but what I think um, you're talking about is something that I have seen and is something that is in this cartoon. Um, and so what it is, is if you look at um, uh, D, um, the, the figure D, um, what you'll see is when this substorm is going on, um, basically it's first starting with a lot of westward motion um, if you're close to the, close to midnight. Um, and then as the substorm goes on, let's say you were right at midnight, um, the earth is rotating under this oval. So a person's location, if we were to um, actually, that would be a great addition to this schematic is uh, because time is moving here. Um, and so uh, a person that starts out at midnight, um, half an hour later is a little bit closer to, to, uh, to dawn. And so you can actually see the transition from um, an arc that breaks up going west, and then there's a whole bunch of substorm stuff, activity going on. And then a little bit later, you can see arcs and pillars and things moving east as well. And that is often, um, that's what happens after, because you are now in the post midnight, it's like 1230, magnetic local time or one or something like that. And so it can be um, it can be subtle and it also can be a moment that you can actually, now that you're like looking for it, um, especially I think you can see it if, if pillars are, uh, if you're away quite a ways away from the south and pillars are moving west and then a little bit later they start moving east or they do both, um, that's, uh, that's cool to see. Is that kind of what you think you saw? Um, yeah, I think it was actually quite late too. I think, um, yeah, it was around two o'clock, like um, yeah. way later than midnight. And uh, yeah, I, I started seeing the, the pillars start to build to the west of me and then started to move east towards the city lights. So yeah, that's why I remember very well because it moved towards the city lights, which I didn't like, but uh, yeah. You're totally getting the point here, which is that, yeah. um, later in the night, um, to more towards morning, that the, you would see something something different um, in more eastward motion. Um, and actually, um, we have quite a bit of the paper left, and I think that it talks about a lot of this. Um, so we are on page three. Um, but, uh, you know, just like the last paper read, we'll probably, we'll schedule another time. Um, not 100% sure if it'll be in two weeks or not. Um, might be a little bit later than that. Uh, but we can schedule another time to keep going with this. Um, do people want to keep going with this now? Um, and see how see how much further we can get. If I would, if I can say, um, I, I might have to leave right away because I got to do yeah. some work. <laughs> sure. Um, sure. Yeah. Um, all right. Uh, are you are you willing to come back if we can reschedule it? If it's a good time for you? Absolutely. Yes. I will. Yeah. Cool. Um, great. I I might just pause there. Um, and actually, I'm curious if Natani, you or Donna have, see, or maybe you, Charles, as well, have seen it go, have noticed that the direction of the motion changes um, as well, like like Gunjan 
uh, asked about? Yes, uh, I, I have noticed that as well. And uh, I didn't realize that it was consistently, uh, I should have, but it was consistently moving from east to west. Uh, but uh, yeah, I know I have seen it moving eastward as well. And I know that at the end, that's in the recovery phase, that's when you usually see the pulsating aurora, I believe. Yes. Yeah. Way early in the morning. Yeah. Do you like the pulsating aurora? If I can get a good picture of it, but <laughs> uh, <laughs> with my previous camera, I couldn't get a good picture. Now I can get, um, they're pretty, but they aren't as intense as the, as the, as the other aurora. Yeah. And I think even as cameras are getting better and better, like that's one thing that impressed me about your amazing photo from last night is that that was clearly not very strong aurora. And so um, that's another reason why it's important um, in the citizen science to submit it to our database because um, it's like, oh, now people are seeing it there and it helps us, you know, track what can be seen and, you know, people might not be thinking they can see it even from uh, July in, in Manitoba and, you know, that sort of thing, so. And it wasn't um, taken with my aurora lens, it was taken with a, a cheap zoom lens, lens. so, um, you know, the quality wouldn't, definitely wouldn't be as good as my regular aurora photos. Oh, okay, okay, nice. I mean, it looked right, amazing to me. <laughs> Natani, did you want to say anything? I saw you shaking your head a bit. <laughs> I was just saying that, uh, yeah, I, I have also, I take extensive amounts of uh, time-lapse um, photography, so I, I get to see the storm motion go from one motion to another, and then sometimes they, it'll coil back from, instead of going from east to west, you'll see certain ribbons of them turn around and spin back towards the, the east, and and it's, it seems like it's colliding and spinning around and making colors and stuff. It's just beautiful. Um, yeah, I've, I've made time lapses, uh, not necessarily all of them from beginning to the end, but it's something that uh, I've observed. Um, yeah, that's, that's all I wanted to say about that. I've... What, I'm, yeah. what I'm gathering from this conversation is that there's no such thing as a bad or boring Aurora photo. Um, we look at it through the eyes of Dr. Akasofu, because if we, if we look at all these different phases and we appreciate all these different phases, it may not be C and D, the showiest part, but it's still really valuable in advancing our understanding. So what, what sounds like to me is like, please don't delete the quiet of photos, please submit those. We, we can learn a lot from them. Yeah, and it's also the global view. <clears throat> so having, <clears throat> sorry, um, having reports from away from midnight where it's, you're, you're getting the edges of the oval as well. Yeah, it's, it's all helpful for checking our models and building better models. And the models don't include substorms. So, you know, they, and they don't include even the level of detail of this cartoon, right? So that is something that, um, someone in the Aurora field, if you're listening to me out there, we really ought to be um, building better models that, and I think we're on the cusp of being capable of doing this, that can um, describe the types of arcs and at least get to the fidelity of um, a, a pretty simple cartoon, like this kind of version. So, so you can have some of that pattern built in as well. That would be really informative. It would be a, a nice step forward for um, Aurora chasers. And yeah, then yeah. there, yeah, go ahead. You could you could have on those charts, you could have sections say, okay, okay, this part of the planet is seeing this phase and this part of the planet is seeing now the pulsating phase. So you can, you, I don't know if that could be put into the forecast somehow, or the, sorry, not the forecast, the models. The prediction, yeah. You yeah. know what, that is a really great suggestion, and that one is within Aurora Source's sort of capability, um, because we currently do have, um, like, the, the basic Ovation Prime model, um, yep. but we could layer, like, this, this kind of information on top of it, so that you would then 
be able to see, okay, it's pre-midnight, so I'm more likely to see this kind of arc, or post-midnight, this is when that pulsating aurora might be the most likely time of aurora. Like, there's probably a very simple overlay that we could um, have that moves through the night, um, which is basically like this cartoon, but moving through the night, um, that might help. Yeah, and I be think kind of cool. Adding that on and, and estimate, oh, sorry. Go ahead. I was going to say, adding that on and estimating kind of where we are in during the current storm for different parts, um, even if it's just an estimate, is really helpful um, for what people should expect to see. Um, and then that's when they can submit pictures that are different than what they expected to see, which says, cool, let's, let's refine the model. Um, the other piece is, can we get live satellite data um, where we can see some of these aurora coming in from satellite? And I know we're still a little bit away from that, but you know, you think about the Soami, um, or I don't know how to pronounce that, but um, those satellites, if we can get that data down and pumped in live real time, um, the compute power exists now, the satellites exist now, and maybe by three or four years from now, when the next cycle is going on, we can actually say, like, here's the pictures coming from satellites of what it looks like, and this is what you should expect to see on the ground. Um, that, that There's so much opportunity there. It just takes somebody doing it and the resources to, to handle the data. Yeah, that's a really good point. Um, and uh, I will, I can sort of say to that, um, the satellites that we have that exist right now, um, the, the data what we don't have is the real-time link. Um, that is something that is also within our scope to increase, not, not mine personally, but it's, it's, it's very reasonable and with the right money and um, scientific motivation that could be done. Um, as well, in the heliophysics field, there's growing um, interest in revisiting global auroral imaging. That is something that we have had in the past. Um, and with modern cameras, you could get down to better resolution as well. Um, and to do that, you need, you would have that link um, properly. And then you also need to design the orbit so that unlike a low Earth orbiting satellite, um, you would get higher up so you could see the whole pole, which would be really cool. Um, so this has all been very valuable um, and I think also what you just said Charles about uh, comparing with photos um, and this idea of overlaying some of the phases of the substorm um, actually one other piece of information that we would need to do that perhaps would be actually coming from people's reports themselves which is if we got the reports of um, here's the onset time then you can really build out that kind of forecast of this was the time and now it's in the expansion phase or you know then you would you would just have a better sense of the flow of it um and and our system is set up to incorporate that real-time data whereas uh, from people on the ground who are seeing that whereas um you otherwise are having to analyze the satellite image or analyze the um, all sky camera image on the ground for those peaks in real time, which um, is not impossible to do, but is not currently done. Um, so there's a lot of really interesting research applications of this. Um, I wish we could all uh, do that right now. <laughs> I'm even thinking, wouldn't it be really cool, like matrix style to have the ability to gather data from different distances and, and have like something pan from the satellite data above out to like Manitoba further away and then to under it in Fairbanks to see the shape in all these different dimensions. Because I know um, I know that that the the structures look very different from different angles and I think it would be just very cool to be able to marry all those together and hopefully we'll eventually get there. All right, so um, we've gone a little bit over time. Um, so I want to wrap this up. Um, we are on page four. And from here, there's more detailed description of the forms and what happens in the different phases. 
So it is really interesting to go through that. Um, Again, there might be some differences in the terminology between the original terminology and what's commonly used now. Um, one difference I see right away is actually there's, um, in terms of the magnetic field measurement, uh, they used to use the symbol gamma, and now we use nanoteslas, and it's basically the same thing. Um, but you will see the older style in this um, paper. But yeah, we'll, we will reschedule and we will hope to have people back and able to join us. Um, so thank you all for taking a little uh, break and learning along with us and for all the really great comments. Um, yeah, uh, so we haven't gotten very far into it, but if you have any, you know, key pieces you've learned, um, Laura is going to be putting together a quiz from this. So while it's fresh in your mind, if you have any suggestions for those quiz questions um, based on this paper reading, I'm sure that would be um, helpful to, uh, to Laura. So um, great. All right. That's it for now. All right. Thank you, guys. Thank you all so much. Well, that was so interesting. <laughs> Can't wait till next time. Even though we only did really four pages, it was interesting. I'm glad. <laughs>